So it's a great morning today, and I'm excited because I believe that God is awesome, and He shows His kindness and love to us in so many ways, and I'm excited for uh, the opportunity to, to share this message with you today about who gets the news. And last week we looked at the news, of course, that I'm referring to is the news that, that Jesus is coming into the world. And last week we saw that the angel Gabriel appeared to a man named Zechariah, and he got the news. He was a priest in the temple, and the news he received was that his wife was going to have a baby. And how did he respond? If you were here, or you've read the first chapter of John, you recognize that Zechariah said, well, I don't know about all this. Now... An angel appears to you and tells you something, and your response is, I'm not sure about this. And so Gabriel was so upset with Zechariah for not listening to him that he, he struck his mouth and he was unable to speak until these things took place. Well, maybe, maybe Gabriel was just one to make himself feel better, so he went and told somebody else the news, somebody that would listen. And that's what we're going to talk about today, because this week, who gets the good news is, of course, the Lord's mother, Mary And I wanted to begin this by putting up a scripture from the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 15. And this is the first scripture in the Bible, clear back in Genesis, that discusses this news. And this is the words of God speaking to the serpent. And he says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Clear back in the Garden of Eden. This news had already begun to be spread. That even though Adam and Eve disobeyed God in the garden and through their disobedience, sin enters into the world, that God's plan was already set in motion to undo what was done in the garden. And this woman, of course, would play a role in that. So let's talk about this announcement that Gabriel makes to to Mary. It says in verse 28 that the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Now, let me talk about this word that we use. If you've read an, an older translation of the Bible, perhaps you see a little bit different rendering of this, and I want to talk about that. There are various translations of this verse that interpret the Greek word, which is ke sheritomine, slightly different. Some translations, like the one we read, read highly favored. Others simply read favored one. But the ancient Latin translator Jerome, writing in the 4th century, he translates the the New Testament from, from Greek into Latin, which was the official language of the Roman Empire. And when he does so, he translates the words into the phrase gracia plena, which literally means full of grace. So let's geek out on this Greek word for a few minutes. I'm not much of a Greek scholar. Uh, I didn't even take that when I was in school. Pastor Mike probably knows way more Greek than I do. But I was intrigued by this word, and I wondered why there were so many different translations of that. So let's, let's look at this and, and just hang with me on this. This word, keisheritomine, has three parts to it. It's got a, the root, the suffix, and a prefix. And each of them tells us something different. The root of K sheritomine is sheritu, which is commonly translated grace, which is a supernatural endowment gratuitously given by God. That's what grace means, according to this word. Scripture sometimes uses this word and emphasizes what God gives, the supernatural gift. And sometimes it emphasizes why God gives this gift, which is because of his kindness and his favor. Both are always present because of God's gift of divine help, which comes from his nature. And God's nature is manifested by his divine help, which accounts for the different translations between grace or favor. Now, let's say the suffix, many up there, that indicates a passive participle. Which means that Mary is passive in this. It means that it's it's important because it means that Mary is the one being acted upon. It's important because it shows that Mary did not bring herself into this graced state, but rather this was an act of God. It It describes Mary as she who has been graced. So this greeting describes her as one who's been graced. Now the prefix, K, 
indicates the perfect tense, meaning the action, which is Mary's being graced, has been completed in the past with its results continuing in a full effect. So what it literally means, if you look at this greeting, and this of course is important because we're talking about who gets the news, what this literally means is this. Mary had a special status given to her by God. She was not just a regular person like you or me. She was full of grace. Now, notice how Gabriel greets her. Our translation reads, greetings. But many others, including Jerome's, render the Greek as hail. Notice the special level of respect that the angel Gabriel gives to her. This is important because we must recognize that Mary's role in this story is larger than many of us may be aware. Mary was prophesied about from the very beginning of the scriptures and throughout the Old Testament. Genesis 3.15, which we read earlier, foretells of God's plan to crush the head of the serpent with the offspring of the, listen to this, woman. Now, we're going to talk more about that phrase woman or that word woman in a few moments. But I want to ask you a question. When you were growing up, how did you address your friend's mother? Think about that for a second. When you went over to your friend's house, did you, did you address your friend's mother as, Hey, what's happening, mama? Did you say that? You say, Hey, girl, how you doing today? Of course not. I remember when I was a little kid, if we, if we, like, it was like a scandalous thing almost to learn our, our friend's mother's first name or our teacher's first name. When I was in a first or second grade, I had a crush on my teacher. Her name was Mrs. Pershing, okay? And I found out that her first name was Sarah, okay? And when it came time for Valentine's Day, when you had to, back in the day when you had to write Valentine's Day to everybody, I put a Valentine heart on her desk and it said, To Sarah from Keith. How scandalous, right? Now, if that happened today, they'd probably cart her off to jail, right? But I put that, and, and, and oh, I got in trouble for that, you know? She came in to, to, I was in the next period class, and she came in with that card, and she came right up to me, and she got right in my little face, and she put that, she said, you will address me as Mrs. Pershing. <laughs> my crush was gone like that, <laughs> right? But think about it. How do you address someone in that manner? The greeting that you give to them or the way that you address them says a lot about who they are. It says a lot about the level of respect that you have from them. Hail, full of grace, is the greeting. Now, if Gabriel, an angel of the Lord, who, as we heard last week, stands in the presence of God Almighty, if that angel, who, let me just say this, when he greeted Zechariah, he didn't say anything like this to Zechariah. And Zechariah was a priest. Mary is like a teenage girl, poor. No one knows of her. Zechariah is a prominent man in the community. Gabriel shows up to him and just says, here's what's going down. He shows up to this young girl and he says, hail, full of grace. Think about that. What does that greeting mean? If Gabriel, an angel of the Lord, addresses Mary with this level of reverence and respect, how much more should we and what does that mean? Now, the reason why Gabriel does that is because Mary is the woman prophesied about in the Garden of Eden. And of course, these prophecies continue as we see in Isaiah 7.14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. It says the virgin, not just some young girl. This is, this is the woman who'd been prophesied. And of course, beyond what is given to us in Scripture, the angels, no doubt in heaven, have long awaited the coming, or from their perspective, the going of Jesus. They knew the prophecies. They knew what God was doing. They awaited the going of Jesus into the world. And this, of course, would happen per God's divine plan and per His purpose. He would create His own mother. And He creates her full of grace. He graces her, you see. 
She is the vessel of the Lord, literally. The Lord is with thee, is what he says. Now, when a woman is pregnant, she's often said to be with child, isn't she? Mary was with the Lord. The angel speaks about that presently because of the, the, the presence of God with her, but also prophetically because she was not yet pregnant. Now, Mary's response and her role are, of course, something that we need to look at here today because that's what we're talking about is who gets the news. Now, it's hard to know how you or I would respond to anything an angel would say to you, right? Have you ever prayed for something like that? You can be honest. God, just send me an angel. Send me something that I know is your will. Let me tell you something. If you or I saw an angel in their full glory appearing to us in our house or anywhere else, we'd probably drop dead right there on the spot. Because an angel is not, you know, the, the, this little cherubim with the baby with wings and a harp and just kind of, you know, tra-la-la-la-la and around on a, on a cloud someplace. Angels are mighty servants of the living God. They're warriors. They do battle with the forces of darkness in this world and in the spiritual realm. They're full of glory. And if we ever saw one in, in their full glory, we would be so traumatized that I'm sure we wouldn't be able to really deal with it. But what would you do if one appeared to you and said something to you? What would you do? When Gabriel came to Zechariah, he didn't believe the angel and of course, he asked for proof, and Gabriel silenced him. But Mary's response is different, isn't it? Mary simply says, yes, I am the Lord's servant. May your word be to me fulfilled. I don't know how you could give a better answer than that. So let's talk about Mary's role now in all this. God sends Jesus into this world, not on a cloud, not through some kind of Star Trek wormhole, not in some flying saucer or some magical way that Jesus just appears, bam. That's not how God sent Jesus into this world. But rather, He sent Him through a human being. We read the Nicene Creed earlier, and what we believe about Jesus is declared in this creed, we believe that He's both fully God and fully human. His divine nature has always existed. Because you notice it said that He's eternal with the Father. He's not created. He's begotten. He's, he's a, a piece of the Father, of the same substance as the Father. His divine nature has always existed. Everything that was created was created through Him. But His human nature comes through Mary, comes through a person. His flesh and blood come from his mother. And this happened for a specific reason. This happened so that we humans could be redeemed by the sacrifice of his flesh and blood on the cross. And that our resurrection would take place because his flesh and blood resurrected as well three days later. For the scripture tells us, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sins. Jesus told his disciples at the Last Supper, which we'll partake of shortly, this is my body given for you. This is my blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Without Mary, Jesus would not have had the flesh and the blood required to secure our salvation. His divine nature has always existed because he is eternal God, but his flesh nature came from his mother. The Apostle Paul writes about that this way. He says in Galatians 4, he says, But when the time, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. You see, Mary has been understood by the earliest Christians. As the new Eve, just as Jesus Christ is often called the new Adam. Think about that verse from Genesis that we read earlier. I found this quote from a bishop from Lyon, France, named Irenaeus. 
This is all the way back to the second century. And here's how he describes it. He says the knot of Eve's disobedience was loosed by the obedience of Mary. In short, where Adam failed, Jesus succeeded. And where Eve said no to God's word to her, Mary said yes. This connection between Eve and Mary is further made in the way that Jesus refers to her. What does Jesus call her if you look in the scriptures? If you look in John chapter 2, they're at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. And Jesus' mother comes to him and she says, they ran out of wine. What does Jesus say to her? No problem, big mama. I got this under control. Does he say, it's okay, mom. I can handle it. No. You know what he calls her? Think about it. He calls her woman. Genesis 3.15. John 2. He says, woman, what have I to do with thee? Which some people read that just in and of itself and they think, wow, Jesus is being a little disrespectful of his mom. See, he's like every other little boy out there. Bad little Jesus, right? No. He says, woman, what have I to do with thee? But then he gives her what she asks for, doesn't he? He grants her requests. He does what she says. And she says to the servants, hey, whatever he tells you, do it. You know what? Mary just preached the greatest sermon ever in the history of sermons right there. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. She says yes, even to her son, you see. And he says yes, even to his mother. He says, woman, what have I to do with thee? That wasn't a disrespectful term. He was calling her according to her title. In John chapter, chapter 19, we see another instance of this. Where Jesus is on the cross and he's, he's perishing, he's dying, he's sacrificing the very flesh and blood he received from his mother. He looks down from the cross and, and he sees his mother and he sees the disciple John. And what does he say? He, he says to her, woman, behold your son. And then he says, son, behold your mother. He's giving her to the church. And he's making sure that she is protected. He doesn't say, hey, take care of my mom. He says, take care of the woman. Revelation chapter 12 describes a great sign that appears in the heavens. A woman clothed with the sun who gives birth to a male child who is to rule the nations. <clears throat> who is that? Who's the male child that is to rule the nations? It's Jesus Christ. Who is that which gives Jesus Christ birth? His mother. This woman. This is not just a neutral pronoun. This is a title. Mary is the woman prophesied about in Genesis and in Revelation. Through her, Jesus comes into this world. Another connection I've discovered as I've studied this that the early Christians make with regard to Mary is a connection that Mary is like a new Ark of the Covenant. She's the new ark. You see, the Old Testament nation of Israel had the physical presence of God in the Ark of the Covenant, that, that box that God had very specific directions for how it was to be created, full of all of this majesty and glory that He would physically make His presence known to the world through. And now He creates a new ark that He would physically be present in. Just as the Ark of the Covenant carried the presence of God in the Old Testament, Mary, as the new Ark, carries the physical presence of God in her body, in her womb. Dionysus of Alexandria, writing in the 3rd century, this isn't just something somebody just made up, the 3rd century says this, As Christ our priest was not chosen by hand of man... So neither was his tabernacle framed by men, but was established by the Holy Ghost. And by the power of God is that tabernacle protected to be had in everlasting remembrance. Mary, God's virgin mother. She carried the Lord in her. So that you and I could carry him as well. Let's talk about her example. Her yes came immediately, didn't it? 
Did she have to stop and go, wait a second, all right, let me, let me figure this out. If I get pregnant and I'm not married yet, isn't that going to like cause me to have possibly rocks thrown at me until I'm dead? Because that's what they did back then. Isn't my fiancé going to be pretty upset about this since I'm a virgin? He's probably going to divorce me. I don't know if I want to go through with this. Can you pick somebody else? You know, am I ready to see my family disgraced? Am I ready to become a laughing stock? Am I ready to be called a liar? Am I ready to risk my life? She didn't let any of that stuff stop her. She didn't let the fact that she would lose her friends and all the respect that she had. She didn't let any of that stop her. So her, she was not bound at all by fear, was she? She simply said yes. But then let's look a little bit else what she didn't do either. Now, I'll be honest with you. The angel Gabriel appeared to me and gave me a special message and greeted me the way that the angel Gabriel greeted Mary and said about me what he said about her and gave me this great role in human history and redemption of the world, I'd probably be like, all right, I should get a better parking spot at church, shouldn't I? I should get a better nameplate on my door. I should get something for that, right? I mean, hey, that's a pretty big deal. Sometimes we would get puffed up if we knew we had that kind of a role to play. But that doesn't happen to Mary, does it? See, she remains completely and utterly humble. She didn't think of herself as a special person. It says that she was troubled by the angel's greeting. She's like, why are you talking to me like that? I'm just a, a simple young girl. I'm nothing special. Think about that. She was troubled at this greeting, not because she had doubts, but because she was humble. See, Zechariah was troubled, not because he was humble, but because he had doubts, you see. That's why the angel struck him with the inability to speak. That's why the angel blesses her. See, when you're humble before God, you're way more likely to be obedient, aren't you? Think about that. It's pride that causes us to doubt what God says. And even worse, refuse to obey on the other hand, religious pride can also be a danger, can't it? Because we can believe ourselves to become superior to other people because of our obedience to God. We can become judgmental to those who we don't consider as important as we are or who we don't consider as holy as we are. Sometimes our obedience can cause us to have great pride. And we can think, oh, well, I'm so obedient. We can become like that, you know, that Pharisee that we learned about in the parables who looked down on the tax collector. Religious pride is, is much more subtle than we might realize, but it's just as deadly. Now, Mary's response and her example and perfect obedience are perfect obedience without pride in herself, but rather pride in God. If you keep reading in Luke, you'll see Mary's song of praise. Sometimes it's called Mary's Prayer or the Magnificat. And I'd like to close by having us read it. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for He has been mindful of the humble state of His servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is His name. His mercy extends to those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with His arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones. He has, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Now, this prayer is all about how awesome God is, isn't it? Even in Mary's acknowledgement that all generations will call me blessed, she gives the credit to God, not herself. 
And she goes on to name the great things that God has done. She acknowledges that God is her Savior. She doesn't say, well, I'm so awesome, look what I've done. She says, I rejoice in God, my Savior. God saved her. This is a great, if not the greatest example of the best way any human being can respond to the call of God on their lives. So may her yes inspire us to say yes as well. Not thinking of our own good being or becoming puffed up with pride as God chooses to use us, but rather remaining humble and obedient and giving God glory for His faithfulness. That faithfulness is what we remember today. And it's fitting that we celebrate the breaking of bread and the drinking of the cup as a remembrance of Jesus' broken body, His broken flesh, and His spilled blood, which comes to the world through His mother. Without her, yes, we don't do this. That's powerful for me to watch, even all these years later. And I want to tell you how people reacted to it. Some people have said, well, were people mad? Did they go, wait a minute, Keith, are you trying to make us all Catholic? Notice, I never said anything about Catholicism in this sermon at all. And the reaction from the people were that they were moved. Many people were moved to tears. I couldn't believe it. There was even one man who came up to the front of the sanctuary, and we didn't really do this in our church. He came up and he just fell to his knees after the service and just began to pray and cry. And all week long, people were coming up to me going, Keith, that was amazing. Where did you get that? What's that all about? Now, in my own heart, I was still processing it too. I wasn't sure where this was going to lead, if this was going to mean anything other than some incredible experience I had had with the Blessed Virgin Mary leading up to that. But I had no clue what would happen to me in the future. And as I look back on that, I'm so thankful, not only that God allowed me to process that and that it's documented here for everyone to see, but for me to see, because it helps me to be reminded and to never take for granted what God has done to bring me into the church. And I want you to think about that because there may be people in your life who you're praying for. There were a lot of people praying for me and there'll be people that you're praying for right now. I want you to ask the Lord's mother to reveal to them her role in that process. Because when she gets involved, my friends, amazing things can happen. And never, ever become impatient with someone or give up on them. There were plenty of people who stayed patient with me and and let the Lord do his work in my heart to get me to the point where I was ready to join the church um, less than a year later, but certainly not immediately after I preached this sermon. I hope that you enjoyed watching it. I know I sure did. And I want to thank you so much for all of your prayers and all of the support that you've given to me in all of my experiences as a Catholic. Thank you so much, my friends. Take care and God bless.